Microservices is a powerful and effective approach to large system design, but they aren't simple. And the approach is often widely misunderstood to the extent that I and most of the experts that I know would probably agree that most teams that claim to be practicing microservices approach aren't. I was discussing this with someone recently in the comments to one of my vi old videos and I thought it was worth exploring this idea a little bit further. So that's our topic for today. What's the real value of microservices and why may you be missing the value of your microservices in your microservice design? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I've spoken about different aspects of microservices as an approach, their advantages and their challenges several times here before. In the conversation that I was referring to earlier that prompted me to make this video, there were two ideas that I really wanted to discuss. The first is a broad definitional problem. That is, do the names that we use for things really matter? Does it matter if what you call a microservice is different to what I call a microservice? I think it does, because unless we can agree on terminology, we can't really communicate effectively. And maybe even more importantly, we can't really learn and make progress as an industry with new ideas. If microservice is just used as a label, and we can ignore all of the attributes of that microservice that define it, what does it even mean to say that we build a microservice system? If we ignore the definitions, we might as well say we build a what's name system. Without that basic level of understanding and agreement of the definitions, these things make no sense at all. The labels that we apply are arbitrary and useless unless we have that understanding. And yet, increasingly, I see people making what sounds to me to be exactly that argument. You're being too pedantic in your definition of continuous integration, microservice, TDD, continuous delivery, or whatever else. Well, not really, as far as I can see. I'm using the definition that usually the originators of the concept defined. Sure, and here's the tricky part. We're so used to being lax with definitions of ideas like these in the software world, that there are often lots of often misleadingly different definitions out there. So it is a reasonable criticism of me that I have chosen the definitions that I like to talk to. But usually, as I said, I try to use the definitions that were the definitions made by the originators of the idea where I can find it. For microservices, I tend to use this list from microservices.io as a shorthand for the fuller description that is, is pretty definitional from Martin Fowler's website written by James Lewis and Martin together. So microservices then are small, focused on one task, aligned with a bounded context, autonomous, independently deployable, and loosely coupled to other services. This is a pretty widely accepted definition. So if your microservices aren't small, focused on one task, aligned with a bounded context, autonomous, independently deployable, and loosely coupled, then they aren't microservices. Whatever it is that you have may be useful, maybe even good design, but please don't call them microservices, it's too confusing. The most important but also most challenging of these attributes in terms of impact on development and being able to scale systems and teams is that they're independently deployable. I think that you can make a good case, and I have in the past, that all of these other things are mostly important because they help us to keep the services independently deployable. Microservices being independently deployable is really the whole game here because it is that that enables us to organize development into many small autonomous teams. And the autonomy matters because that is one of the most important predictors of success from the findings of the Dora metrics. Smaller autonomous teams build better software faster. Let me pause there and say thank you to our sponsors. We are fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts and Transfic. These companies offer products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss here every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, please do click on the links in the description below to check them out. All of this may sound great, but independently deployable is actually setting a pretty high bar for design and requires a level of design sophistication that many teams struggle to achieve. 
Certainly most so-called microservices systems that I see don't have services that are independent and deployable. That is, services that can be deployed without testing them alongside every other service before release. I've spoken about that before. Another aspect of this design problem, though, is something that cropped up in my discussion with that viewer in the comments. He said the vast majority of microservices that I have seen actually share a common database and data model behind the scenes. I agree that this is a common pattern and a problem, but once again, not microservices because they aren't autonomous. We can't change one independently of the other. Or at least there are some kinds of change that we can't make without impacting both. We can't change the schema for the storage in one service and not upgrade and deploy the other service if they both depend on the same schema and the same storage. My interlocutor gave an example, processing an order for a customer of where this may pose some design challenges. We could imagine two services, order processing and customer details or something similar. The lure here for more traditional thinkers, more traditional meaning those more used to normalized databases, would be to build something like this so that when an order for something came in for a customer, the shared data store links the order to the correct customer account record. But this is why the bounded context alignment matters here. Fundamentally, there are some fairly strong limits to the scalability of normalized data. Data normalization is good in that it means that there's one version of any fact, but it has a downside is that the interactions with those facts represent a form of coupling. So often distributed systems where the data is normalized are much more difficult to change. I spoke about a related issue to this in this episode. By joining our services via their storage and data representation, we are leaking information here and increasing the couple, coupling between them and so making them harder to change. Microservice is a distributed systems model and in distributed systems, the problems of data synchronization can be very complicated. So it pays to avoid them as far as we can. And that is to a large extent what the advice about align with bounded context and no shared data is all about. If we restrict ourselves to only sharing information via the messages that travel between the services, this has a lot of advantages. It means that the conversations are clearly and well defined. There are no back doors. All interaction is through the APIs of the services but it also makes more clear what the problem that we need to solve is. We need to define a conversation, a protocol of interaction between the services that copes with the cases that we're interested in. Being lazy and falling back on the now oversimplified model of normalized data to keep our services in step with one another, we're breaking the microservice model in a fairly profound way. We've coupled two distinct bounded contexts together for technical reasons. That's a bad idea. So now the code for both of these services is harder to work on, harder to test, harder to maintain. And if it is held in separate repos, it's also slow and annoying to change because we've got to be jumping between different repositories every time we want to do something. Completely the opposite of the advantages that microservices are meant to offer. I'd say that this design approach is poorly abstracted at the service level. Even though at a surface level, the use of normalized data makes it easier to get started, it will be much more difficult to maintain in future. This is a common problem with design, I think. The naively tactical solution often feels easier at the start, while modeling the real problem that you're interested in and trying to solve takes a little bit more thought. Let's imagine some of the operations that we'd like these services to support. The customer detail service will need to be able to create and register new customers of some form and hold their relative contact details perhaps. Account ID, name, address, email, perhaps a phone number. What aspects of this information matter in the context of placing an order though? Almost none of them. All we need to know if we're placing an order is which customer is it for? So all we need is the account ID, the most loosely coupled relationship between the customer details and an order is the account ID. I talk about three levels of modeling for services like these in this video. So our order processing service only needs to store the account ID for an order. If it or some other service needs to access more detail of the customer, 
like the customer's email address perhaps to tell it when the order's been dispatched. It should ask the customer details service to give us those details at the point when we need them. It doesn't need to have access to them directly itself. We may be concerned that our very simple approach to order processing means now that people can place orders for non-existent accounts. And we don't really want to clutter the system with useless orders this way. Well, we could solve this problem by getting the customer details service to notify the order processing service with new customers when they're added. So now the order processing service can maintain its own list of valid account IDs and check that the account ID attached to an order is in that list. Even though the data is now not normalized anymore, there are duplicate lists of account IDs in both services. This isn't a bad thing though. This is a common strategy for maintaining the relationships between data held in different services. Yes, you have to do a little bit more housekeeping work to keep things up to date and tidy, but the result is a significantly decoupling between the services, which makes this whole system easier to work on. For example, I could write a test of the order processing service without the need of a customer service detail service. Because all I would need to do for my test is to notify the order processing service that account 77 was added and then place an order for account 77. The big difference I see here is that instead of relying on generic technical levels of integration between the parts of our system, instead we make these conversations much more explicit. We abstract them at the level of the business problem that we're trying to solve, not at the level of the technologies that we're using. This means that the conversations are simpler. And if we follow the good advice to always translate information that trans transits between bounded contexts, these conversations are now dramatically more loosely coupled and more explicit, an inherent part of the design of the system that makes sense to everyone, not just to the technologists on the team. These conversations become important integration points in the system, more obvious and so much more manageable as a result, more defensible in the face of change. This also makes things lots easier when we want to add new features because the conversations that are already supported are now explicit, clearly defined via the APIs to the services and make much more obvious sense in the context of any given service. Let's imagine adding a customer accounting service to our design. It listens for customers being added and also for orders being added and it stores the list of orders for a customer. We could imagine the service keeping a running total of the amount spent by the customer on each order and maybe sending out a notification when the customer spent over a certain threshold amount that meant that they now got, a, got into a more privileged account status or something. The real trick here is that these conversations are all taking place at the level of abstraction that represents the problem domain, not the technicalities. We are in the language of placing orders and creating customers rather than of adding records and defining select statements. This is a much healthier level of coupling and I recommend it to you. Thank you very much for watching. I'd like to say thank you again to our Patreons for supporting us. And if you're interested in joining, please do check the links in the description below. Thanks, bye-bye. <laughs>